Welcome to Focus on Health, a series of educational programs highlighting current health issues sponsored by the Department of Nursing at Salisbury University. I'm Dr. Mary DiBartolo, Professor of Nursing at Salisbury University and host of the program. I welcome Katie Dorsch. You are a clinical dietitian at the Richard A. Henson Cancer Institute. That's right. And this is your first visit to our studio. Yeah. Um, previous to this, we did do a cooking show where you were talking about cooking for cancer prevention. Yeah. So today's topic will be just about general cancer prevention. Um, so I, let's start off with some statistics. Sure. I know I found one from the National Cancer Institute. Now these are 2016 numbers, but it's estimated that there's over 1,685,000 new cases of cancer each year. Yes, and sure. of course, the, the four major types we think of are breast, prostate, colorectal, and lung. Yes, yes. But there is some good news. There is, so it's estimated that up to half of all cancers could be prevented. Uh, with a few modifi modifiable uh, risk factors. And I know we're going to go over each one of those. Yes. Um, and of course the other good news is we're also much better at curing and or treating many cancers where people are living a lot longer or are totally cured of their cancer. And of course we have some wonderful screening tools as well. And That's I know right. you'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah. So let's first start out with lifestyle factors that can help with cancer prevention. So one of the biggest is just maintaining a healthy weight. Um, so either if you're already of a normal BMI, maintaining that weight, or if you are overweight, uh, trying to reach a more healthy weight, uh, being physically active is also a big part of that. So trying to exercise for at least 30 minutes a day, 30 to 60 minutes a day, um, every day to either try and maintain or lose weight um, is a big uh, lifestyle factor. Yeah, I know several, there are several cancers, and I know one of which is breast cancer that is mm -hmm. definitely tied to obesity. Exactly, um, and especially obesity in your waist, so that's central obesity, um, and trying to lose abdominal fat. And then central obesity also isn't good for heart disease and That's stroke right. and heart attack risk factors. So yeah. it, it's all good. Yeah, it kind of all goes together. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, maintaining a healthy weight and active, being active or exercise, which helps with the weight as Correct. well. So yeah. what are some other tips you'd like to offer? Um, some other things, reducing your intake of sugary drinks. So things like sodas, um, sweetened teas, uh, things like frappuccinos and lattes that you might get at the coffee uh, place. Uh, fruit juices as well um, can have a lot of uh, sugar in them. So trying to reduce your consumption of those beverages, replacing them with things like water, um, even fruit infused waters without added sugar, plain tea and coffee. Um, and reducing those sugary drinks and kind of empty calories will help you reduce your calorie intake overall. And again, go back to maintaining a healthy weight. Exactly. I know another um, type of beverage that people think um, <clears throat> isn't a problem is Gatorade, and that's actually very sweet. Correct. And people just assume, well, it's healthy, it replaces electrolytes, where actually just plain water will do. Exactly. Um, so even sports drinks like Gatorade, Propel, those types of things do have a lot of added sugar in them. Um, so unless, you know, you're really working hard training for that marathon, um, most of us don't need those types of bever beverages. Okay, what's, what's another tip? I know one thing I wanted to ask about was are there any um, supplements or vitamins or extra um, supplements of this nature that people can take that could help with pre cancer prevention? Sure, so there's a lot of supplements on the market uh, these days. It's a huge business, um, especially online and on the internet, of people selling supplements and vitamins, fish oil, things that are supposed to boost your metabolism or help you lose weight or um, you know make you healthier. Uh, but really what we found is that uh, getting your vitamins and your minerals from food is always going to be better for you than taking a supplement. So unless you have a particular deficiency in some type of vitamin or mineral, um, there's no need for you to take over-the-counter supplements. 
I know I think a lot of people feel it's so much easier to take a pill to get certain vitamins, but it's actually better to eat the fruit or the vegetable itself because that has things like fiber in it, which is also good for the GI tract, and we know fiber yeah. is good for preventing colon cancer. Yeah. Yeah, um, so fiber, vitamins, minerals, and those phytochemicals, those are those compounds that you find in food that can help protect your body against cancer. Um, and those types of things are gonna be lacking in supplements. What are some examples of other types of um, supplements people might take that really um, aren't giving you the bang for the buck that you're paying for? Because that's the thing, they probably don't hurt you unless you take them in large amounts, but you're spending money on something that you probably don't need to. Sure, so um, just regular multivitamins, a lot of people um, tend to lean on those, um, but if you're eating a healthy diet, um, they're really not providing any benefit for you. Um, things like fish oil that we hear a lot about, especially for protecting um, cardiac health. Uh, we found that taking a fish oil supplement isn't quite the same as just eating fish on a routine basis in your diet. Um, so that's really not going to provide much benefit for you either. And what are some of the healthier fishes that you should Sure. Eat? So things like salmon, tuna, those uh, fattier or oily fishes, um, sardines if you like those, mackerel. Um, anchovies, those types of fish are going to have a lot of those omega threes. So even things like canned tuna or I was canned say, salmon. Tuna in a can. Yep, it's the it's the same thing as you know getting that seared fillet at the restaurant. Um, and it's going to have the same benefits. That's good to know. Yeah, a little on the uh, less expensive side. <laughs> exactly. And easy to make. Yep. Okay. So what about? Um, We've been hearing this for many, many years about uh, red meat, processed meat, lunch meat, those kind of things. And we know that that's not as good for you, sure. at least in excessive amounts. I guess you can have it occasionally, but what's the downside of eating too much red meat or processed yeah, meat? Yeah, so both red and processed meats have been linked especially to colon cancers as well as um, stomach cancers and really kind of, you know, all of your gastrointestinal tract. Um, so the recommendations for red meat, which would include things like beef, lamb, and even pork, um, even though pork's always been called the other white meat, it's really considered it a red meat. It counts as a red. It does. It counts Don't as a red like meat. <laughs> <laughs> um, so beef, pork, and lamb, um, those red meats, we recommend limiting to 18 ounces or less per week. So that still does allow you for a couple of servings a week of red meat if you enjoy it. Um, processed meats would include things like bacon, sausage, hot dogs um, that people eat a lot of, uh, especially in the summer. Um, so really we recommend limiting those um, to just occasional treats. You said for beef and lamb and pork, uh, no more than 18 ounces a week. Mm -hmm. What's a typical serving? I know they say you should kind of just have it sit in the palm of your hand. Yeah, if um, let's say you're using the palm of your hand as a guide, uh, that's going to be about a four ounce portion of meat. Um, so about a quarter of your plate okay. would be about four ounces or so. Most people eat more than that. They do. Yeah, most people tend to fill up half of their plate sometimes with meat. Um, really, we'd like you to fill up half of your plate with fruits and vegetables, a quarter of your plate with that meat serving, um, and that'll be a, a cancer protective diet. And where are we on starches? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, carbs aren't the enemy. Uh, you know, our body needs carbohydrates. It fuels our daily activities. Um, so that other quarter of your plate next to your uh, meat portion could be your starch portion. And of course, we prefer things like whole grains, starchy vegetables, beans, lentils, those types of things that are gonna have lots of fiber. Are you allowed to have a potato? You are, yes. <laughs> Potatoes get a bad rap. This is a potato but... <laughs> society, isn't it? I guess it's better to eat it with the skin on if you're gonna have a potato. Exactly, something like a baked potato, roasted potatoes with the skin on, a baked sweet potato, those types of potatoes are definitely healthy for you. Um, they have lots of potassium, fiber, um, they'll fill you up. You want to avoid things like French fries, mashed potatoes with a lot of added, <laughs> mm -hmm. 
uh, fat to them. So healthier starches is what that you're looking go for. That doesn't on the shore. The mashed potatoes <laughs> is popular around here. And it of course, is. the fried chicken and things like that. Yeah. But everything in moderation, I guess. You can have an occasional. Correct. Sure. Yeah. Um, that's not to say we never have mashed potatoes in my house. We certainly do sometimes. Um, but for the most part, focusing on those healthier preparations. I know some people try to pass off cauliflower as a, you know, use that to make mashed potatoes. And I guess you could do it halfway. I tried making it 100% yeah. cauliflower. It just didn't do it for me. I know. I enjoy mashed potatoes, so. So eating mashed potatoes, real mashed potatoes in moderation uh, is certainly a good idea if you like mashed potatoes. If you want to add some cauliflower to your mashed potatoes, it's a great way to get some extra vegetables in. And what about, I know french fries are bad, but I think there's plenty of people that just love to have french fries occasionally. I count myself as one of those people. I guess it's better to eat the french fries if they keep the skin on, like the wedges and so forth? Sure. So, I, especially at my house, I like to eat french fries sometimes too. So, we'll usually just cut up some potatoes either in wedges or um, in uh, small slices and bake them in the oven. And that's definitely a better way to eat french fries than the actual fried fast food french fries. Other tips? Um, definitely uh, adding more fruits and vegetables to your diet, like I said, is going to be a good thing to do. Um, the salt uh, that you find in processed foods has also been linked to especially stomach cancers. Mm. Um, so eating more freshly prepared whole foods, as we like to call them, so things that you prepare yourself. Um, and limiting your intake of that excess salt is going to be a good idea. And that's good for your heart as well. It and is. Blood pressure and all that. Yeah, so. it all kind of works together. Um, <laughs> definitely limiting alcohol. So there's a lot of studies about red wine being good for your heart, um, which it might have some cardiac benefits. Uh, but especially for preventing cancer, it's recommended that you limit your consumption of alcohol. So two drinks a day for men, one drink a day for women, if you are going to consume alcohol. Of course, if you aren't, you certainly don't need to. Um, so don't and, take up drinking. <laughs> correct. Don't take up drinking thinking you're going to fix your heart issues. <laughs> right, right. I mean, but it's okay to have one drink a day. In fact, I think a, a more recent study came out saying no more than five drinks a week now. Right. Because people kind of took that drink a day, I think, a little too... Right, too a little hard. too liberally. Mm -hmm. um, and no, you can't save up all your drinks for the week for Friday night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sticking to that one drink a day yeah. um, is going to uh, decrease your risk of all kinds of cancers, head and neck cancer, esophageal cancer, uh, GI cancers, colorectal cancer, um, that whole route that the alcohol mm -hmm. may travel, liver cancer as well. Well, I know you're a dietitian, so you're mm -hmm. an expert on food and what, what we eat and drink and so forth. But I think since you also work at the Richard A. Henson Cancer Center, um, you're also aware that there are other things we can do to help prevent cancer in terms of screenings. Sure. So what are some of the more important things we can do in that regard? Sure. So um, making sure that you're getting uh, regular colonoscopy exams, uh, pap smears for women, uh, we have skin cancer screenings that we offer a couple times a year at the Richard A. Henson Cancer Institute, uh, both in Salisbury and in Ocean Pines. Um, so those are great tools to kind of make sure that you're getting um, screened early so we can detect things earlier. Um, there is also low-dose CT screening now available for patients at risk for lung cancer. Mm -hmm. um, so it, especially if you're a smoker, um, talking to your doctor about that and seeing if you qualify for that screening um, is important. And of course, not all people with lung cancer smoke, but it definitely is a risk factor for lung cancer, but there are some cases where people never smoked and develop lung cancer, and it can run in families, I believe. There's a genetic Correct. piece to um, that. Correct. There can definitely be some genetic factors as well as other types of exposure, whether it just be to secondhand smoke um, or industrial uh, things like asbestos and um, other types of, of chemicals and dust that you might come in contact with um, throughout your life. And of course, we know women in the mammogram and men getting their prostate examined and check, younger men checking themselves for testicular cancer, because a sure. lot of these cancers, the earlier you find them, the much better the prognosis. Yeah. 
Yep, so making sure you're getting um, all of those screenings that are appropriate for you. Your doctor can let you know at what age um, you should start getting those screenings um, and making sure you do them regularly. And a lot of it depends on family history. They mm -hmm. say 50 for your colonoscopy, but if you've had it in, in your family, a first degree relative, you should sure, yeah. go sooner, make um, sure. There have been a lot of uh, colorectal cancers coming up earlier and earlier. Um, I think a lot of it might be related just to diet and lifestyle factors as well. Um, so if you're not eating a healthy diet or have a healthy weight, um, you know, starting there um, can make a big impact. So Katie, I guess the moral of the story is, you know, eating food that's food. You know, eating real food, fruits and vegetables, and of course you can have some meats, but in moderation focus more on chicken and fish and of course the whole grains and things we've talked about and there seems to be an emphasis on this in restaurants as well because we know we're a society that eat out, eats out a little too much probably. Sure, yeah, so definitely preparing uh, food yourself at home when you can. Um, those whole ingredients like you said, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean meats sprinkled in, um, but having a big emphasis on those fruits, vegetables and whole grains, um, limiting your sugar, limiting your salt, um, having chicken and fish instead of red and processed meats, uh, those kinds of things will definitely help uh, your heart, they'll help prevent cancer, and they'll just help you feel better overall. Well, before we wrap up, um, tell us a little bit about the Richard A. Henson Cancer Institute. I know you must have some exciting programs and things going on there. Sure, so uh, we have locations both in Salisbury and Ocean Pines, and we do some programs at the Mac Center as well. Um, so nutrition-focused programs, we have a class called What's Cooking um, that we do once or twice a month uh, where we'll prepare healthy recipes um, and let participants sample, so that's open to uh, cancer patients and survivors and of course family members as well. Um, we have a healing garden at the MAC Center so any cancer patient or survivor is welcome to come and get fresh produce um, that they can take home share with their family so it's a great way to get those fruits and vegetables in. Um, of course there's screening programs offered through the Richard A. Henson Cancer Institute um, so look for that in the community. We have skin cancer screening um, usually each spring and fall. Uh, so those are big programs. And then of course, unfortunately, if you do end up getting cancer, um, we have comprehensive programs. So with radiation oncology, medical oncology, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, as well as nutrition services, we have social workers on staff, um, support groups available for all kinds of cancers, for caregivers as well. Um, so a variety of programs offered. So for the skin cancer screening, we forgot to mention an important thing, um, the importance of wearing sunblock and being very careful in the sun is something sure, very definitely. common sense. Yep, um, so using sunscreen, uh, you know, covering up where you can, especially wearing a hat in the summer if you're going to be outside in the sun um, to protect your scalp, uh, those types of things can go a long way. Well, it sounds like you have some great things going on over there. So I really appreciate you coming in today to talk to us about cancer prevention, something that you know most of us think about. Sure. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Focus on Health here on PAC-14.